All right, hi everyone. So as Jared said, my name is Anthony. I'm gonna be the business analyst running today's webinar. And we're just gonna quickly go over an agenda. We're gonna look at some PowerPoint slides and then we're gonna go into the demo. So we're gonna just quickly touch on what is Power Apps Pages or Portal. Um, Microsoft is very infamous for rebranding things constantly. So Power Apps Portal is just an external facing website. They've now renamed it to Pages. I might use Pages and Portal uh, interchangeably in this demo. Um, we're going to look at our solution design. So today we're going to be demoing a user requesting a specified document. They're going to access the portal. <clears throat> they're going to upload um, some form attachments, um, and then they're going to receive that requested document back to them via SharePoint. We're going to look at the information architecture we've designed for the solution just briefly in SharePoint. Um, the kind of tasks we're going to be automating with Power Automate, which is a very powerful tool um, in the Microsoft environment. And then what do you need in order to implement the solution in Power Apps Pages? And then finally, we'll get into our demo. So firstly, solution overview. We're using three apps from Microsoft. We're using Power Automate, SharePoint, and Power Apps. So Power Automate enables you to create those automated workflows and connections between different apps and services within the Microsoft environment or to also external apps. Um, SharePoint is our document repository. This is our collaborative environment that enables document management, storage, and sharing. This is where our form submissions are going to be saved and then where the requested documents are going to be uploaded. And then finally, we have Power Apps, which is the backbone of the solution, as this is where our portal or page is going to live. And as I mentioned, a portal is an external facing website that allows users to sign in with a variety of identity providers. And then they can create and view data in the Dataverse. Um, the Dataverse is just where all information is being stored from forms or tables and lists. But basically, the, um, the portal enables users to access a form to request documents. Just continue. And now we're going to walk through the solution design um, more granularly. So we're just going to go step by step. And as Jared mentioned, if anyone has any questions at any point, we do have our question box in the chat. And we'll also touch on questions at the end of the demo. So firstly, um, since this was designed for a previous client that was an educational institution, um, we would have students, parents, or users sign into the portal with their chosen identity provider. So you can have Gmail, Twitter, Microsoft, Facebook. Users can also create local accounts, but we do recommend utilizing identity provider where possible. And after they've authenticated into the portal for the page, they are going to now submit their form. So users have to be authenticated in order to view the form. Once they've authenticated, they go to the form, they submit answers to all the questions, and then they upload an identity document to verify they are who they are, so they can get access to those documents they're requesting. And after they successfully have submitted the form, this is where the magic happens and our first workflow is implemented. So they're gonna receive an automated email saying, hello user, you've submitted your form. Um, you're going to expect to hear back from us or get your requested documents in a X amount of time that can be customized to your organization's needs. And then we have our workflow kicked off. So workflow number one creates a PDF of form of the form answers. So instead of users having to look at the raw data in a spreadsheet, we're taking these form answers and populating them into a PDF template. So it's much easier for users to read and find that information quickly. We're going to save our form attachments into SharePoint, so the workflow will do that automatically. And the workflow is also automatically creating our information architecture. So after that first workflow is finished, that automated email has been sent, staff can now go in and review the form submission. So we have a special column that we'll touch on a little later called application status. But once they start reviewing that form submission, they can change the status to in progress. And that will just send a little automated email to the user just saying, hey, um, your form submission is now being reviewed. Expect your documents within X amount of days. So as I said, that's an automated email. And now let's say staff have finished their review. They've looked at the identity documents uploaded. Everything checks out. So they're now going to upload the requested documents of the user to the SharePoint. And now they're going to change the application status of this form submission to completed. And this will kick off our second major workflow. So once the application status has been changed to completed, the, the user who submitted the form is going to receive an automated email with a link to their requested documents. This is a secure link that can expire within a set amount of time. So we can choose seven days, one month, whatever your requirements may be. 
And this is a link where they can only download their requested documents, as we'll see later. So they can't navigate backwards. They can't edit anything. All they can do is download their requested documents. And so the user receives the email with the link. They click the link. They download the documents and they get their document request. There's the document request is now successful and they get everything they need. So um, we're just going to look at some quick power pages benefits. So it allows authentication through a variety of methods. So Facebook, Google and more. The documents are secure and they live in one location. So if you currently have a business process implemented where you have external facing users or internal users requesting information, documents, um, maybe FOIP requests, um, oftentimes those solutions implement email um, attachments. So we have a lot of documents floating. We have a lot of information sprawl. This presents a lot of risks for the business and for users sensitive information. Um, I'm sure everyone's maybe been in a situation where they're going through a process and then it says, oh, can you please submit some ID and they don't have any portal or anywhere to store that. So you have to take a picture of ID and send it through email. So obviously that presents a lot of risks um, with the portal. Everything is stored in one location in SharePoint. You can apply sensitivity labels, retention labels. All that information is securely within Microsoft. Um, this solution also can be implemented out of the box. You don't need any custom JavaScript. So once we pass on that solution to the client, it's a lot easier for them to manage because there's no custom JavaScript or anything injected into the solution. Um, you can create forms with branching and allow attachments. So for example, a Google form, um, I believe Google forms do allow some form of branching, but they don't allow attachments. So that's a major flaw in that um, system. Um, you can host multiple forms in a single portal. So maybe you have three or four different forms and they can just be put as tabs on your portal's homepage. And then finally, you can create a list to show data records. So when a user successfully submits a form, um, aside the emails, there's also gonna be a list on the portal that says here are your past submissions, um, here's that application status and a link to that document um, if the status has been changed to completed. And then this is the information architecture we've set up. Um, we can always come back to this because it's a little harder to conceptualize before we see our SharePoint. But basically in our SharePoint, we're going to have a library, document request library. And then every time a form is submitted, we're going to have an auto-generated folder with a unique application number. And then within those auto-generated folders, we're going to have two subfolders and then a PDF of those form answers. So subfolder number one, contact ID, is where all form attachments will be saved. Requested documents is where internal staff will upload those requested documents from the form. And then the PDF is just all the form answers being saved in a PDF format. And now we're just going to look at business process automation. So with implementing Power Automate, we're able to um, automate a variety of repetitive or redundant tasks for internal users, therefore allowing them more time to focus on the reviews or other tasks at hand. So here are just some things that we are automating with the solution. We're automating the creation of folders and storage of attachments in SharePoint. We're automating all emails sent to portal users, um, which I'm sure a lot of people would like because emailing can take, a, take up a big chunk of your time and having those emails automated is a huge benefit. Um, the creation of the secure links is automated. We can also automate the deletion of documents, password reset processes if a user created a local account. And finally, um, the creation of that PDF is also automated as well. And then in order to trigger this automation, um, one of the major triggers we have is application status. So as you'll see in our SharePoint site, um, we have a column called application status and the demo environment is just called request status. But application status is a choice column with a drop down of selected options. So we have completed, submitted, in progress. And then when an internal staff member chooses a given status, um, that will trigger different things. So the most powerful one is completed. Once a form submission has been given the completed status, that generates that secure link in email to the end user. We also just wanted to briefly mention that the portal is dynamic. So we know these days when people are requesting documents, more often than not, they're using their mobile devices and just natively out of the box, the portal um, dynamically responds to any screen's dimensions. So whether a user uses a laptop um, or a smartphone, the portal will just change its display method 
but um, there's nothing else you need to configure. It appears both on mobile and desktops um, without any issues. And now, finally, what a lot of people would be um, really interested in is saying like this solution sounds very like interesting to us or we would like to implement that, but what do we require in order to implement the solution? So this page is just a breakdown of everything. So we have our license requirements. Um, we recommend that all users have an E5 or an A5 license. The E5 license is the general recommendation for any solution as it's much more powerful than E3. But with E5, you can implement different SharePoint admin settings, compliance settings, and a whole host of other things within Microsoft. So if you do want to have that retention labels or sensitivity labels, you will require E5. Next for our Power App subscription. So in order to provision the portal, um, there's currently three um, different plans that users can choose from. So we have the per app plan, which is one app or portal per user. We have the per user plan, which is um, unlimited apps or portals per user for a flat monthly rate. So that one's a little bit more as it's unlimited. And then the per app plan pay as you go. And this one uses an Azure subscription um, to pay per user based on the number of unique apps that a user runs per month. So one of these plans will have to be selected in order for a user account to create a portal. After you've created a portal, um, you're going to need a Power Automate Premium Licensing. So in order to have that connection between SharePoint and the Dataverse, we are using a premium connector there. And so for Power Automate Premium, we recommend the first option licensed by user, but there's three options in total. The first option licensed by user just allows individual users to automate cloud apps. Um, this plan allows a user to create unlimited flows. The second plan is basically the base plan plus the ability to automate legacy apps. And then finally, license by flow allows unlimited users within your organization to run these digital processed flows. And now um, add on plan um, for the portal. So with portals, their main benefit is allowing those authenticated logins. So that was just an add on on top of the portal. So um, in order to allow authenticated logins into the portal, that's just an add on plan. If your solution does not require users to authenticate first, they can choose to just have anonymous where they will not log in and they just can automatically see the form. And then finally, in order to implement the solution, the account that's provisioning the portal and creating everything, um, the recommended role is global administrator. And if that's not possible, then in order to implement the solution, the account will need a power platform, SharePoint, and compliance administrator account, or sorry, role. And after all this talking, um, now we're ready to get into the demo. So if for the demo case, we're gonna just have a user submit a document request through Power Pages. So they're gonna submit a form, upload some attachments, and then after they submitted the form, internal staff can then review that form submission in SharePoint, upload the required documents, and then change the application status to trigger that workflow with the secure email and the automated, sorry, to trigger that workflow with the secure link and the automated email. So here we are on the portal. Just so on the portal, um, this is just our landing page. We haven't done any special design. What we want to highlight today is the functionality of the form. So as you can see here, we've already authenticated in with our demo account, and now we're just going to go on to the main form. So these questions were from a previous client. This is just to demonstrate the functionality. Um, the questions can be anything that your organization would need or what you would require. Um, we're just going to demo the functionality. So don't get too, um, <clears throat> if some of the questions may be unclear or something like that, it was just for a specific client's mm -hmm. solution. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're just gonna click accept terms and conditions. And then this client, they just wanted a fee acknowledgement page, so we'll select no for that. And now we get to our first portal question that's just asking um, for this document request, are you requesting a document for yourself or for someone else? So if you're a parent, you would select that. Um, for the demo, we're going to say, no, I am the student. I'm requesting on my own behalf. And now we just have some more questions. So the relationship to the student is ourselves. I'll just put in my name. 
equal number. Yeah. Just going to copy that. Now, I'd like to show something. If we do not have a valid email address, let's say a user types an invalid email address and they hit next, um, the portal is able to pick up on this and it'll say email addresses must be valid. So this is kind of like a check and balance to ensure that when users are inputting information, they're inputting the correct information. And for other things such as first name, last name, phone number, they can also be configured in different ways to put restrictions. So maybe phone numbers like, you know, numbers only, things like that, maybe a restriction on how many, um, the length of the number, all those things are possible within the portal. And now it's just asking us, are we requesting for multiple students or a single student? So since we're requesting just for ourselves, that would be a single document request. Um, this is just to show different branching. So um, for those for that client's questions, they just needed some different branching sections where depending on a user, they could choose different questions on based on the requirements. So now we can choose what kind of um, record are we requesting? What's the request type of this form? So this is probably one of the most important questions. In Power Apps portals or pages, um, you can create form questions that are choices. And there's two types of configurations for this. You can have a single choice or multiple choices. And this is pretty powerful, wherein maybe um, you have multiple different documents that a user could request for themselves. And instead of having to repeat this form submission multiple times, um, they can already just choose all the documents they require in one go and get them all in one form submission instead of having to do multiple submissions. Uh, since I'm requesting on my own behalf, I'll put my own name again. Um, if I was a parent requesting on the behalf of my child or student, I would put my student's name here. Um, we'll just do today's date for birthday. And then we have another question saying, do you require these records to be sent to an educational institution? For the demo, we're going to say no. If we were to say yes, it would just take us to a page to say, um, please give us the name of the university and address, please, or email address. And the next question um, is asking, so for these documents that you're requesting for yourself, um, do you require them to be delivered to you as a physical record or can we email them? So once again, for the solution, we want to demonstrate that secure link and um, the digital documents. So we're going to say no to that. Yeah, we get to a um, very important part, our proof of identity. So this is where we're going to upload the form attachment. Users would click add files. I'm just going to click choose files. I'm just going to upload this driver's license. And we're going to see the saved into SharePoint. And now after this one, it's going to take us to the review page. So for the client, um, they initially wanted a review page where a user would be able to see all their answers um, before they hit submit. Um, then as they progressed in the solution, they decided that having a user review all their answers before submitting might cause some inconsistency errors. They might go back and change information. So they eventually just um, decided on only having a user confirm their email address a second time, as the email address is the most important piece of uh, information, as it's where all those automated emails are going to be getting sent to. So if this page is a little long, that's why it's just including everything. And then if a section is optional, it's just been labeled as such. But as you can see, we can review our form submission so we can see my name, email, all of that um, request type. And then also the attachment we just uploaded. And this will take us to our final page in the form. So we have our application number 1514. So we'll keep that in mind for SharePoint. And then all we have to do is hit confirm that all the information provided is true and hit submit. So once a form has been successfully submitted, it takes us to this my request status page on the portal. And then this is just a simple table or a list um, where an authenticated user can see all their past um, form submissions. So this is unique to them. They can only see form submissions that they've submitted through their account. And here they can see the form source, applicant, first and last name, the date it was created, and the email address also provided. So now um, we're just going to go into SharePoint and show the back end side of what internal users will be seeing. Now we're going to navigate into SharePoint. We're going to refresh. 
And here we see our unique application number has been created in SharePoint at the very top here, 1514, created just a minute ago. Um, this demo is in real time, so all workflows and automated emails, they take about a minute to a couple minutes in order to appear. So we'll look at the email after. First, we're going to look at just the SharePoint. So as I mentioned with the information architecture, we have our SharePoint site. We have a library called Document Requests. And within our Document Requests library, we have our different form submissions, which, um, which each have a unique application number. So our application number was 1514, so we're going to navigate into that. Um, I just wanted to mention that um, these are kind of like folders, they're document sets, and the key difference is just that document sets allow metadata to populate downward. So within our folder document set 1514, we have our two subfolders, requested documents and contact ID, and then the PDF. So requested documents should be empty as this is where internal staff will upload those requested documents um, from the form submission. Contact ID though, is going to have a form attachment. So if I click this, um, users are able to natively view that form attachment within SharePoint Online. So once they're going through that PDF and if the name says like, um, what's the name here? Uh, sample Sam, if the form submission um, name and the ID documents don't match, then obviously there's an issue there. And then that would require um, contacting that user saying, why does your ID not match your form submission? But in this scenario, let's pretend that it does match. And we're going to go into our PDF. Once again, we can open this up in SharePoint Online. And here we see all those questions I answered in the form now populated into a PDF template. So we have our date created, our application number, the form source from the portal, and now we see the questions being populated. So relationship to student, I'm requesting for myself. We have my name, last name, phone number, email. And then here, we can see the record type being requested. So proof of education in English, and then grade nine results for application to post-secondary. And once again, the student's name and the student's last name, date of birth, et cetera. So this is quite powerful as um, now, um, internal staff, all they have to do is they have one tab for the document request, another tab for ID, and all they have to do is check and see like, oh, yeah, name matches in the ID, matches in the PDF, they're requesting proof of education in English, let's upload that. So before I upload those requested documents, I just got a ping on my computer, and I just received the automated email, so open up that, and here we go. So portal request 1514 has been successfully submitted. So this email is auto-generated by the system. It says, hello, Anthony Salapek, and that information is actually dynamically imported from the portal. It says we've received your request. Um, you'll be notified when your documents are ready for pickup. So I'm just going to close that and go into requested documents. And now for requested documents, I'm just going to upload a sample PDF. And notice how the metadata is populating downwards, as I mentioned earlier. So we're going to navigate back to the parent level for this application, 1514. And we're going to change the request status or application status to completed. And this is going to trigger our second major workflow. Once again, if I navigate back into this application, um, it's going to populate downward the metadata. Refresh this. So just on the SharePoint here, I'm going to go down as we put requests, sorry, as we put submitted request statuses at the top and then completed at the bottom. And now after we've changed this, we're going to receive the auto-generated link to the user. So that's just going to take a couple minutes once again as it's in real time. Um, something I want to mention is if I scroll down a little farther here, um, see. Here we go. So <clears throat> I'll navigate back again. For this number, 1452, as um, a compliance aspect for our records managers out there, or for people concerned about data management in SharePoint, um, we've created an auto-applying retention rule saying when request status has been changed to completed, um, please apply this retention label. So in this one, we can see 1452 
we have a retention label applied to our documents in here. So if a user were to try and delete it, they're going to get a message saying, sorry, that's not possible due to the policy. So, and then we just have our test label um, applied to the document as well. So that's how you can, a way of managing documents in your SharePoint is applying retention labels. And retention labels can be applied uh, manually or automatically, but where possible, we do recommend automatically. Okay. And I'm just going to check my email, see if we have any updates there. New mail, no email yet, so it takes about, from previous test, about one, two minutes for that application status to change. So let's navigate back here. Now we see the metadata has been updated to completed. And our requested document also has completed metadata. So this is also from a search standpoint. Um, if you were to search at the top here, let's go uh, 1514. So it's returning the parent document set, but it's also returning all the documents, um, even though they don't have 1514 in their titles, such as the PDF test or the ID document, um, because the application number, it's appearing. Okay, there we go. So we have our application number once again, 1514, and it says, hello, Anthony Salapek, um, your request number has completed. Please log into the portal to view your documents or click the link, click the link below. We're just going to copy that hyperlink. So I'm going to quickly show back on the portal. We go to the My Request Status page and we refresh it. We see now that from the portal, our application number 1514 has been changed to completed and there's a link uploaded here. So end users have two options. Um, they can click the link directly from their email or they can log back into the portal and click the link from here. It's um, at the user's discretion. Probably most people would click the link from the email. If your organization has limitations about sending links and things like that, then the user would have to manually log back, back into the portal to click the link. And now I'm just going to go into this browser here because I have to go into a browser where I'm not signed in. I'm going to paste this link. And so this is the link I copied from the email. And you're going to notice that there's a do not edit sign beside the requested document. Um, they can see the metadata beside it. They can click the document from here. They can download it. And if they navigate backwards, they're not able to do that. They're not able to do anything but download. If they were to click this, there's no option to delete or any of that. And they're not able to see other people's requests. They can only see their specific request. So this secure link is quite powerful. And then after seven days, it's going to expire. And if the user clicks the link, they're going to receive an error message where they're not going to be able to see anything then. So it's just important that users, after clicking the link, they download their documents. And we've reached the end of the solution. They requested the documents through a, P, um, a Power Apps Pages form. They uploaded form attachments. Then internal staff review that, um, review their, um, their form submission. They upload the requested documents. And after changing the application status, it triggers that automated email and they get access to their PDF document or whatever document they've requested. So I'm just going to go back here. And so that leaves us now room for any questions or anything you'd like to see more from the demo or things like that. As I know, we did go pretty quick. We went through some PowerPoint slides. We went through the full end-to-end -end process of the demo, um, the start to finish process of what that would look like if you had users requesting documents from your organization. Hey, Anthony, um, we did get a question here from Alan. I, I didn't get the a ping on the notification in the Q&A, so I apologize, Alan, but uh, uh, are, are the forms hosted managed or uh, hosted slash managed by Power Apps any different from those you can make in the Forms app or are they the same? Oh, okay. That's actually a very good question. So I'm going to just close this um, from here. So in our app launcher, uh, we should be able to see it. So Forms as part of like Microsoft, um, I'm assuming you're referring to the Forms app. This is internal. So this is for users inside your organization. Power Apps Portal is for external facing users. So if you have um, 
as in the example, like an educational institution, like a school. So um, let's pretend, you know, you're a school board. Um, you have parents or students requesting for records. Um, they're not internal users to the organization. They're not going to have access to everything in your SharePoint site. So they need this um, external facing website to answer questions. So sometimes people, they would utilize Google Forms because they're quick to set up and you can have external users quickly submitting forms for a variety of requests. But there's a lot of um, caveats to utilizing Google Forms. So with Power Apps Portal, you can have this external facing website then for users. And there's been a lot of um, companies and organizations that have successfully implemented portals for document requests. And if you were to search up some examples through Microsoft, um, a lot of portals were actually deployed during 2020 um, and 2021 um, during the pandemic. So a common portals you would see on the internet um, is portals for vaccination records. So users requesting a vaccination record or submitting a vaccination record in order to have access to some sort of organization or business. So there's a lot of portals like that kind of floating around on the internet that you would be able to see. Um, there, I've seen portals provision for government, government organizations for users like um, uh, let's say an example, like a user has to submit some sort of like permit or thing like that. Um, the real power in Power Apps portals or pages is that external facing component. So um, users do not need to be part of your tenant. They can just be like browsing a website and submit the form. So I hope that answers your question. Uh, he said a follow up here to uh, which app designed the form in this solution? Oh, which app designed the form? Yeah. So the form is created um, internally in Power Apps. Um, so if I were to just navigate back once again. Go that one. So here we see Power Apps. So I'll just I'll click on that. So there's a little bit of um, digging here, but within solutions, um, we have this EPSB demo solution. And then we're going to have like a custom table that we've created and basically at the backbone is um, within Power Apps, we create a table and then here we have our data experiences of how we're displaying this table's information. So the way it works is that um, columns correspond to questions in our form and then we just create a form based on the columns that we've created here. So this is the area where the form would be created. It's within Power Apps. And we can create the form, um, we can create this list view, and then we can push those externally onto the portal. So when we're creating our portal, we just upload those um, elements. So we can upload um, a form, a list, all of that. So everything here has been created within Power Apps. Everything you see is Power Apps. Um, and then, yeah, Power Apps is the backbone of the solution. And then SharePoint is just where we're storing form submissions and Power Automate is just kind of like that um, connector between everything. Thanks for your question, Alan. Uh, Anthony, I'm, I'm sure that uh, was enough for, for answering. <laughs> Good work. Uh, we got another one here in the chat. Uh, can you share an existing solution slash item, et cetera, with another user who can then edit for their needs in Power Apps? Okay, so <clears throat> I'll also quickly mention uh, uh, you are able to unmute yourself now if you wanted to, and you can ask questions verbally, but I totally understand uh, typing things in chat if you're more comfortable with that. Go ahead, Anthony. Yeah, so with solutions in Power Apps, Everything we provisioned here was under one account. However, within Power Apps, you can have um, different roles assigned to users so they can have access to the solution. So it is possible to have um, multiple people um, going into that solution and editing the table, editing the questions that are visible. So the questions, as I said, correspond to columns. Um, from a management standpoint, um, we don't recommend like a lot of people having access to the solution in the portal. We have that one account that has provisioned it. Um, one thing to mention with Power Apps portals is that the account used to provision the portal will always be shown as the owner. So um, there is an area where you can like assign other owners, but 
from a visual standpoint, you're always going to see that main account as the owner. That's just a caveat right now that might change in the future. And the main account that provisions the portal has um, full access to everything. So when you are sharing um, the solution with other people, you just want to make sure they've been given the appropriate roles. Otherwise, they may not be able to see things. So um, yeah, that, I hope that answers your question. So it is possible to like have people collaborating in the solution and things like that. It's just that um, you need to ensure they have the appropriate roles. Thanks, Anthony. Well, I hope that answered your question there, Sarah. Uh, are there any more questions we have? Oh, we got Anthony on the line here. Okay, uh, Ray, sure, um, you can unmute yourself. Or send it in chat. I have a question about uh, the forms in the portal. My understanding was, or my understanding is the portal is external facing. Right. So the people yes. outside of the tenant can can access the forms or request the forms. Can you set it up internally or is the portal always external? Yeah, um, portals can also be um, external also. So it's just kind of based on your authentication requirements. So with um, portals, there's also different permissions. So right now we've configured permissions in a way where if anyone, whether they're in your tenant or not, authenticates and creates an account, they can just see everything. But with portals, you can actually apply different permissions saying like, only users like let's say like part of our tenant who signed into the portal can see this and if they're not part of the tenant they're not going to be able to see anything they, they won't have the permissions for that um, if that were to make sense so um, if i were to like sign out here i can kind of show you what that would look like so if you do not have the appropriate permissions after signing in or if you haven't signed in at all and you click like any of these tabs um, you're just not going to be able to view them and actually if you click the form it's going to require you to sign in so portals can be implemented. Um, they can be used for external facing, but like if you want to use them internally in your organization, that's a possibility as well. Um, I do believe when you publish them, um, you just would have to select for your portals publishing stage um, whether you actually want it to like be visible from the internet or just internal to your organization. So would that change the licensing requirements or do you always have to have that I don't remember exactly what it was called, the portal license for people that, for permissions. So if I go back to this slide. So the way the licensing requirements work, and we've displayed all the options, but just as a preview example of what we've done for a client, they had um, A5 licenses for their users. They chose the per app plan. So the per app plan just allows you to create the portal. Um, without that plan, you can't create the portal. So it's just, it's like very basic. It's like that first um, start stop gate saying, um, if you have not purchased this plan, you just won't be able to create a portal. Um, I think you might be able to create a portal on, under a trial for like 30 days, but after that, you're gonna lose access to your portal and the solution and all those um, backend things in the dataverse. So, yeah, um, that's the first option. And then if you're implementing power automate in your solution and you're utilizing premium connectors, uh, once again, they just bought the first license, which is just um, allowing individual users to automate that. I believe that one's like $15 a month. And then they also chose the add-on for authenticated sign-ins um, because they want to track people who signing into the portal in and out. Um, if the portal was just anonymous, then they wouldn't choose that add-on. So you know that's uh, sorry. Go ahead. Or, I was just going to say if uh, the add-on plan is um, to record the users that go to the site, but if it's internal, would you have to have that add-on plan? Um, so with the add-on plan, that's just ha having that page here. So if I hit escape for signing in. So if you want the portal to be solely um, 
internal and you do not want people to um, if you just want people to skip the sign in process, uh, I think the way that would have to work is if the portal was in a location where people can access and maybe from the power apps level, like a certain amount of users have given been given access to power apps and they can like navigate to find the portal from there. Or there could be like a link set up internally where it's like users can click this link and access the portal. Um, and then for portal publishing, you would just have to choose that it's not um, live because I believe once a portal is pushed to live, it's like visible from the internet. So like external people could find it from searching and things like that. Um, so it just have to be put on an internal basis and then have users internal to your organization access that link. Um, from a security standpoint, we um, always do recommend like d it depends what they're asking for too um, in your organization. So it's hard to say, but with portal permission, you can still configure logins and then just set the permission saying like a user has to be internal to the organization. So uh, maybe for example, you have a portal and you have an employee that has a business account and a personal account. Um, maybe they're using their personal account to view the information and um, this um, sign in page would just force them to use their business account to view the portal or something like that. So um, I hope that answers your question. Um, yes, thank you. Yeah. Uh, do we have any other questions regarding like portal, our app, some of the things we're doing, emails, all of that? Looks like looks like we're good, I think. For now, anyway. Um, if you guys do have any more questions, you can go back to the. Uh, PowerPoint there, Anthony. Um, if you guys do have any more questions, of course, you can send them out uh, to Caden Solutions at any time. Um, that's Anthony's email right there on the screen. Uh, he'll be happy to answer anything you guys send him. Um, so yeah, our contact info is there. We encourage you to tell us your pain points. You know, we'd love to provide a solution catered specifically to your issues. We, we've seen a lot, we've been around, um, and uh, we know every organization is a little bit different. So uh, if that's all we got, well, thanks so much for attending today and uh, have a wonderful rest of your day, guys. All right. Thank you for Thank the you virtual so much, claps. <laughs> See you guys. All right. Thank you. Have a great evening.